Thank you very much. Uh, you're most kind, but you know, when you live long enough, you meet an awful lot of people. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I have had enormous, I've had a wonderful life so far. And it's been interesting. And uh, much of it had to do with what was happening to me here at North Texas. And I'm great, grateful to so many people for coming to my rescue when I first came to teach here full time. Oh, I taught off and on, mostly in Philadelphia, but not really, not really devoted to student teaching. And it's different. And that's why I said my, my life had three uh, areas. One, uh, first, as a concert violinist, I was deeply grateful to have the opportunity uh, to appear as soloist in almost all the major symphonies in the United States. And then I started concertizing. I had concerts in Europe. But I really didn't want it. I know that sounds ridiculous. I know it doesn't sound, but I didn't. First of all, at the age of 16 is when I really started playing concerts with and appearing as soloist with the Philadelphia Orchestra with uh, Mr. Romany conducting, and uh, I won a youth contest. And then I went on to uh, study conducting with Monteur, and I got the, what I call a disease. It's called conductoritis. <laughs> it's hard to shake. In fact, I don't think you can. Not really. And I had it. And I was going to conduct. It didn't matter how, what, where. And there were many obstacles. OK, that, that's, there are always obstacles when you're trying to build a career. But that was the second part of the A and B. And that part was the best way to learn is to play in an orchestra and watch the conductors who come in. You learn from the very good ones what to do. You learn what not to do from the bad ones. It's as simple as that, really. And I enjoyed being getting concertmaster. And I, I was a wonderful sight reader, which helped me tremendously. If somebody was to ask me, well, how do you learn the sight read? I don't know. Except find the parts and learn them. Uh, and that's in the book. You know, if, you, if you read it, it's in the book. Uh, most everything about me that's in the book has with relationship to uh, uh, other artists. <laughs> you can't ask them because they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> They're gone. I know that uh, I, I'm living way past what I'm supposed to be, but I'm sorry, that's the way it is, and I can't do anything about it. Uh, my wife has better genes than I do, and since she's here, this is my darling wife, Marilyn. Oh, my <laughs> she deserves that, believe me. She deserves your applause because uh, she's been married to the same man for going on 64 years. Can you imagine with the same man? Well, could I take it the other way? <laughs> the same woman. But, but she's been wonderful. She's never said, you can't do that, or you're not going to do that. There's, there's no way. And every once in a while, I would fall into a trap with her. And well, to give you a wonderful example, and I don't think she wants me to tell you this, but um, I became conductor of the uh, Dallas Symphony. And I was, it's not in a book, by the way. I wouldn't dare write it. Uh, and she uh, was at home, and I was part-time, you know, an adjunct, adjunct professor or so-called temporary conductor while they found a conductor that they wanted. Actually, they chose me. Okay, that's fine. And I was commuting from Dallas to Philadelphia. 
I still had my family, you know, the three children, my wife, who were living there, and I was here in Dallas, fly back to Philadelphia, and that was that was fine. That worked very well. Except that I came home at the end of the, about almost towards, towards the end of the year, and I mentioned to her that there was a women's committee, young women's committee from the Dallas Symphony. They wanted me to make a speech to them. And she said, uh, are they asking you for a topic? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll figure out one. She said, well, you better think about it. I said, well, I'll, get, I'll find a topic. And I forgot all about it. Well, it, towards the end of the year, I was the conductor now, and I was coming home from Dallas, and I was sitting, looking at some scores, and Marilyn was in the kitchen. You know, we, we were joining, and she stuck her hand and said, did you talk to the women? I said, no, not yet. She said, do you have a topic? I said, yeah, well, I, I'm going to tell them. And sure enough, the phone rang. And she stuck her head out, and she said, uh, it's one of the women from the women's committee. They want to know your topic. I said, well, tell them I'll call them back. She said, no, I'm not going to tell them anything. What's your topic? I said, sex and the married woman. She said, oh, one of your shorter speeches. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for her. Well, anyway, that's, that's, I think, one of the reasons we've stuck together for so long. She understands me, and I certainly understand her. But the reason I, I really am overwhelmed is the acceptance of the book. I never dreamt that so many people, uh, not, not, not talking about students, of course, students, if they can afford it, they'll buy the book. It's all now on Amazon, it's come on, um, what is it, Kindle? But the reception and the reviews have been all wonderful. Just terrific. And a lot, and most of it, is due to the co-author. And I'd like you to meet Robin Bunderdahl. That's my darling writer. <laughs> and she's going to read some parts of it for you from the book that she finds special. And then if you have any questions, uh, ask them. If I can't give you an answer, I'll figure out one. <laughs> Just take it up. That's it. You, do you want she to hold it? Oh, no. Well, want me to hold it? She need, no, she needs it on the stand. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> she can't hold the book and the mic. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. You don't have to be too close. It's very sensitive. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm going to read from the book Events That Occurred in 1966, near the end of Anshell's time uh, with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Can you all hear now? Is this turn on? Can you hear? Okay. That's it. My tenure with the Philadelphia Orchestra would end with a six-week tour of South America. Naturally, Ormandy programmed works by South American composers, like the illustrious Argentine Alberto Ginastera. I came into the dressing room I shared with Dave Madison on the day we were to begin rehearsing Ginastera's concerto for strings. Dave had my violin case open and the music on the stand, as usual. Unusual, though, was his expression. His eyebrows were drawn together, and he avoided looking at me. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine. I just hope you're going to be. I glanced at the music. Solo violin was how it began. <coughs> Next came notes written as quarter tones, which meant they should be played out of tune, easy enough. Then I looked across to the opposite page. Mountains of black notes tumbled over each other, heap after heap. He's got to be kidding. Dave shook his head. I was a good sight reader, but this was impossible. I would have had to work on it for weeks. I hadn't, though. I was starting right now. 
what was an honest violinist to do? I wasn't one on that day, so I don't know. The composer deserved my respect, so I allotted to him the summit note and the valley bottom note of each mountain. I would only hijack the dozens that fell between. Immediately, it seemed to me, we were all in our places, Ormandy giving the downbeat with his baton and looking at me. I played through the easy part, and then the mountain range faced me. So, I gave Alberto Finisterra his valley note, zoomed my own way up a snaking trail, gave him his summit note, and skied back down a breakneck speak to his note at the bottom. Countless times, never the same twice, until I had fulfilled all the measures written in that way. The look on your face can fool a lot of people, and mine suggested conviction and bravado. When my solo was over and a rest came, I picked at something on my knee. I had no idea if the others, including Ormandy, were staring at me and thinking, why on earth did he put that A in there? Or there's no E flat in that measure. My speed, though, gave me a cloak of secrecy. I didn't think anyone could pick out a single note and tie it to the written music. It was a relief that Ormandy didn't say anything. Neither did anyone else, and we moved on to the rest of the piece where the whole orchestra played. When we got to the end of the concerto, Ormandy said, good job, and patted me on the back. Others also congratulated me. I didn't like to say thank you when it was so undeserved. The next day, I came to rehearsal feeling pretty relieved about that piece. It was only when we opened the music, Dave and I, of course, sharing a stand, that the danger of my position became clear. Since I didn't know what exactly I had played yesterday, how could I play the same thing? If I improvised it differently, I would be outed. I focused my mind and dove into those wild black notes, hoping they would resemble what I had played the first time. No one said anything, so far so good. And so it went for the days of rehearsal. It got easier each time. We performed the concerto in Philadelphia before we left for the tour of South America. This was my last performance at the Academy of Music. And there I was committing fraud. Ormandy actually gave me a bow and the orchestra applauded. Before we left, Ormandy told the orchestra that Hinastero wouldn't be able to attend our concert in his city, Buenos Aires. I tried to put on a downcast look. On the tour, the Philadelphia Orchestra bounced around from country to country, pleasing our audiences and having a good time. Often, Hinastero's concerto for strings was on the program, and I became entirely comfortable with it. One day, I admitted to Sammy Mays and Dave Madison that I had improvised most of it. I don't believe you, was Sammy's response. That's something I would never have figured out, Dave said. We went to Argentina and played the Buenos Aires concert. Getting that behind me was a big relief, even though I knew Hinastero would not be present. Mexico City was the final stop. A field house had been converted into a concert hall by constructing a stage at one end and setting out 2,000 chairs. There was no backstage and no dressing or preparation area for the players. Ormandy had the use of a big tent to greet dignitaries and guests. I came down to breakfast in the hotel on the morning of the concert. Ormandy sat in front of a plate piled with food. And Shell, he was beaming. You'll never believe who's coming tonight. I considered the president of Mexico or a Mexican composer. Hina Stara, Marmandy breathed ecstatically. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, I said, that's wonderful. At least we weren't playing his piece. Marmandy chewed on a piece of bacon. I'm changing the program, of course. So. I have claimed that I wasn't nervous before performances. This would be the exception. I considered getting sick. As a matter of fact, I began to feel sick, but Dave couldn't play it in my place. I considered closeting myself for the hours that remained and trying to learn the actual notes Hina Stere had written. There wasn't nearly enough time. A terrible thought occurred to me. 
What if Hinastera had already heard me on the radio hijacking his music? He could be coming to set the record straight. Ormandy demanded, decided that we should rehearse. Afterwards, I wandered around behind that huge wooden stage looking for a hiding place, since there were no dressing rooms. Back in a corner, a few old chairs stood near some dark, dusty curtains. I was able to pull the curtains over the chairs to create a small room. It was so dirty, I had to be careful not to touch anything. I had a view of the stage entrance, and Dave was looking around for me, so I came out. Where, where were you? Oh, I wanted to warm up. Now we were on stage. Ormandy came out. The Hinastera was the first piece on the program. I had no options. I played it the same way I had been doing throughout the tour. At the end, Ormandy acknowledged me with a bow and did the same to Hinastera. After the concert, I scurried back to my corner and closed up my violin. I knew the shortest route to the exit. I would have to take my violin with me since the truck where the instruments were stored and transported was not on my path. I just had to get by Ormandy's tent and then there was an exit to the street. It was dark and many people were milling around the tent so my chances were good. I clutched my violin against my side, ducked my head and practically jogged. Anshel! Anshel! Our manager, Boris Sokolov, was someone I didn't feel I could ignore even during my last week ever with the orchestra. He beckoned and I stepped into the tent. Not far from me stood the tall and robust Alberto Hinastera. I thought, if he hits me, he'll kill me. <laughs> and immediately, he did start toward me with energetic strides. I felt petrified. But his arms came up from his sides, not with fists, but with open hands. And he embraced me and kissed me on both cheeks. I never dreamed it could sound like that. <laughs> Make me go. Suddenly, everyone in the tent began to applaud. Ormandy was beaming, which could mean anything, and I was sweating bolts. I was so honored to play your concerto in your presence and managed to say to Hinastero, had I finally done it? I had missed out on playing Sibelius for Sibelius because Zell wouldn't release me to perform with the Philadelphia Orchestra. I had played Shostakovich for, Shost for Shostakovich in such a way as to get him in trouble for writing bourgeois music. Now, had I played Hinastera for Hinastera and managed to please him with my brusilized Hinastera? Some months later, when I was no longer in the Philadelphia Orchestra, my phone rang. The person on the other end of the line tried to speak, but his words were lost in laughter. Over and over, he said, Anshel, and tried to start talking. I recognized the voice, Sammy Mays. He's programmed it again this fall, he finally managed to squeak. The Hinastera. And Norman played that solo. Norman Carroll was the concertmaster Ormandy had hired to replace me. He was a fine violinist. Oh no, I said. Oh yes, he starts the solo, and Ormandy flicks the stick at him. No, says Ormandy, what on earth are you playing? If I had imagined that Ormandy would program Hinastera again, honest to God, I would have called Norman. But what would I have said? <laughs> Sammy went on. So Norman says, I studied it. These are the right notes. And Ormandy says, it's all wrong. And then he looks at me. I felt a twinge of remorse thinking of Sammy on the hot seat. And Ormandy says, Sammy, that's not what Angel played, is it? So I have to answer, and I say, it doesn't sound like it, Mr. Ormandy. And all the while, Dave is sitting with his hands over his face. He doesn't want anybody asking him anything about it. So Ormandy says to Norman, you need to learn this music. This is the Philadelphia Orchestra. <laughs> Some months later, I ran into Norman Carroll. Before I could get the apology out of my mouth, he said, if I had a gun, I'd shoot you. <laughs> I suppose it's just accidental that I had completely morphed into a conductor by the time I was fixed in someone's crosshairs.
finished. He just put on the spot. Ben Schell knows all the answers. <laughs> That's right. If he doesn't, I'll make one up. Thank you. Good girl. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to be disrespectful to Lena Sierra. That was farthest from my mind. I knew that I had an idea of what he wanted, but I couldn't. There's no way. I don't know anybody that could have done it. And from what I understand, someone said to me, he changed a lot of it when we got back to the United States. It's changed from what it was originally. Because it really, it just uh, the kind of uh, notation that it was was uh, almost, I won't say unplayable, no, but it really wouldn't have flowed as easily. And that's as good an excuse as I can give you. <laughs> but I had fun, and uh, my whole uh, career as, as an orchestral musician and a concertmaster was uh, mixed with great pleasures and lots of laughter. I enjoyed being a member of a symphony orchestra, only when we had very good conductors. That helped greatly. That was fun. But when we had poor ones, that's when I just said, I'm going to conduct. <laughs> no matter what. But I'm going to let you in on a secret that has nothing that really, uh, nobody, I've never said this, but every part of my career had to do with my family, my wife and my children. I wanted to be with them. And I would arrange my schedule so that I could spend as much time as possible with them. And the best way to do that for me was not just a soul violinist would not have done it. Besides, there were other incriminating circumstances, and that's in the book. But also the fact that I felt that solo violin was limited in a repertoire. How, what, what, what's to play? You know, Barham's big dog, Tchaikovsky. That's it. Sabine, excuse me. Sabine. And I just wanted to have the time to spend with my family. And so I worked it around them. I worked the solo violin part afterwards. I could play in the orchestra. I would have a rehearsal, let's say, from 10.30 to uh, 1. And then I'd go home. And I'd wait for my kids to come home, and then we'd play a game. I'd teach them how to rob a bank. <laughs> No, no, I'm serious. I, I did it well. I, we, we'd play it. We'd, we'd be downstairs, and I never, I never took my violin home. That's another story, but that's in there. I, I never took it home because I didn't want to practice. I was busy with my kids. So, uh, and I explained that my David uh, was the oldest, and I taught him how to be what we called, I called him trigger. And my middle daughter, uh, Jenny, I called her Gunball. And the youngest was just my sidekick. That was Mindy. And she's the one that was mostly most talented. Although others, the other two were very talented, really. But they didn't want music, and I mistakenly let them off the hook. But that, that happens. One in the family is enough, really. Although I had hopes for my daughter, Mindy, who played the piano very well, that she might end up one day coming up here and playing a Mozart piano concerto with me. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Okay, so we can live without that. She's doing very well. Um, now, do you have any questions for Robin or for me? Don't, please don't be shy. That's good, because uh, you are uh, really. This never happened to me before. It's terrific, isn't it? <laughs> well, what else do you want me to tell you about the book? That, that uh, I, I really, uh, there's so much that go, that went, I'll tell you how long, you know how long it took to write the book? It took us three and a half years. And she was wonderful in that she came to the house with her computer and sat there 
and I would talk to her, and she'd write these things down, and then she'd send me an email of what she wanted to write. And I'd send it back, saying, that's fine, it's wonderful, or it just doesn't sound like me. And there were times when I thought, no, that, that's not me. And thank goodness for Marilyn, because Marilyn said, if that's not you, you're wrong. I know what you sound like. <laughs> and I guess, you, you know, you, you make a mistake, you think, you sound that way. It was the old story of Toscanini, who was recording Beethoven First Symphony. And uh, they were listening, going to do the first movement, and then Toscanini said he'd like to go back into the booth and hear it, hear what, he, hear what it sounded like. And he did. He went back and they started to play it, and he said, well, no, 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 no. I, I want what I just recorded. I want my recording. That's not mine. And he said, Maestro, that, that's your recording. He said, no, no, it's too fast. I don't do it then. <laughs> well, I, that's what I told her. And that's what she wrote. And that's not what I said, I thought. Actually, I did. When I've reread it, yes, it was. And so it, it took that long. And when Robin submitted it to the uh, Competition, what was the Mayborn. Uh, Mayborn. Mayborn competition? The manuscript. I thought, well, well, well it's wor worth, uh, worth a try. And there were 13 nonfiction prizes, I believe. If, I, if I'm correct, I, I'm, I'm always right anyway. <laughs> there were 13. And uh, I thought, well, uh, she'll tell me when. She went to the dinner and they announced the winners. I had no intention of going. I mean, uh, first of all, I'm not very good at dinners. And second of all, I'm not going to come near any winning. And she called. Robin called me and said, I have a funny feeling about this. Uh, but uh, if you don't want to come to the dinner, that's fine. But I think it wouldn't hurt if you showed up. So I said to Marilyn, okay, I'm going to go to the dinner. Would you like to come? No, that's fine. <laughs> I said, would you like to go to my place? And she said, no. So I was ready, and I did go. And I sat at this table with a number of people. One of them was a judge, and he was acting sort of interesting, let's put it that way. And they started giving away the prizes from 13 down, 12, 10, and they got to the last three prizes as I sat there. Third prize to someone that left two to go. And I thought, I don't know, I mean, it's, there's no way. And the second prize to such and such. And I thought, well, at least I'm not even, well, not even mentioned. And then they brought in someone to announce the winner from New York, the winner of this prize, first prize. And when he started out by saying, the musical world is very strange in many ways, I thought, oh my goodness, I don't believe it. And there it was. First prize, said Robin, after the applause subsided, she said, uh, I think we have to go up on the stage. Because <laughs> I was just spellbound. I didn't know what to do. And I, I did. I, I went up and we went. And we got the first prize. And we got a wonderful publisher, which made me feel right at home, UNT Press. Terrific. And they have done a just wonderful job. And uh, Bonnie and uh, Ron have just are special people. And I have found a relative a cousin of mine in Moscow. And he has been interested in finding a publisher for us in Moscow. And he has found one that's really not only interested, but in translating the book. And I think that's exciting because I, I know this sounds a bit ridiculous, but I think it would sell better, the book will sell more and better, will sell better 
in Europe than it does in the United States. Just really simple. If you think about it, how many young people attend classical concerts as opposed to how many young people attend classical concerts in Europe? Oh, come on. You know it and I know it. That's the, that they live by those. And we know because of the reception that the orchestra that I've been with have played, like even in South America, uh, they've shown up, they've been there, they've just wanted desperately to hear classical music and they will want to buy the book. And I think we are on the right track with this. I really, really, I hope so. So now, if you haven't had any more questions, I'll make them up as I go along. So, I mean. yes. Maestro? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I edited the book for UNT Press. Thanks for saying those nice things about us. I'm Karen Duvini. One thing that I was fascinated with when I was editing was um, your description of growing up in Philadelphia surrounded by all these other musicians who went on to professional careers. I wonder if you can describe that neighborhood where you grew up for us. Uh, in relation neighbors. to other musicians? The Gombergs and the... Oh, yeah. the Gombergs. Well, I lived in an area which had many, many uh, well-known professional players. And they ended up staying or visiting with my family constantly. Now, uh, some of them were uh, like the, the Gumbergs. Ralph was the an oboist. Uh, my brother was a wonderful clarinetist. He was a great clarinetist. And he was a roommate of uh, interesting, a roommate of Leonard Bernstein on Bernstein's first visit to the Berkshires. In fact, he, Lenny and my brother and uh, uh, Leo Gomberg was a trumpet player. I have a photo which not, was not in a book uh, on horseback, uh, which was interesting. Because <laughs> none of them rode poor horses. But. And so, uh, they were family. Also, Ralph uh, was an oboist, and Harold Gomberg was an oboist, first, first oboe of the Philharmonic in New York. Uh, Sidney Sharp, who just recently passed away, was a well-known, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, contractor. Uh, contractor. Thank you. Contractor in Los Angeles and did very well, also a graduate of Curtis. And uh, uh, speaking of Curtis, Curtis, uh, I was 11 years old when I entered Curtis. Uh, that's awfully young to be going into a, an institution like that. But uh, they accepted me. I wanted to study with Ephraim Zimbalist who was, at that time, very well-known violin, violinist. He was a student of Leopold Auer, as was Heifetz and Misha Elman. Oh, do you know that Misha Elman played, uh, I was a violin soloist with me, when I conducted the Chamber Symphony. Always oh, a lovely little man, short. And he spoke like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he came and played with the Chamber Symphony, and uh, after the concert, it was charming. And he went back to New York, and I went back home. <laughs> and the phone rang about 9 or 9.30 in the morning, and I heard this, Hello, Mr. Borsov? I said, Mr. Allen. He said, yeah, 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 it's me. I said, yeah, so what, what's up? What's happening? He said, you know something? I said, what? He said, you know, I didn't get paid. <laughs> I said, you didn't get paid? Well, didn't they tell you it was a benefit? <laughs> and it was dead silence. A benefit for who? <laughs> and I said, for me. He says, what? Oh, no, you could be fooling. I said, yeah, yeah, no, I'm kidding. That was a, it's, you will be paid, I promise. <laughs> we were having financial problems, but he was paid. For me? 
<laughs> so that was the thing that was going around for quite some time. Benefit from Michelle. The only one that I really admire, one of my idols as a violinist was Yasha Heifetz. I only met him once. However, I spoke with him on the telephone. And that's an interesting story, and I don't know if we put it in the book. It's in the book. I still think there's room for one more book. <laughs> if you're game, Bob. Uh, and uh, I uh, had just, believe it or not, signed a contract with RCA to make recordings, five recordings in one year, before even the Chamber Symphony of Philadelphia existed, which was never heard of, never heard of. But the head of RCA, Red Seal, was uh, someone who had been manager of the Philadelphia Orchestra and knew me, and knew the players I would get and what it would be. And so when I went to visit Roger Hall, he said, I'll give you a contract. You'll record five works with the Villanova Tabor Symphony, which are now still available. Would you believe that? In fact, there are some of the things that I recorded with Philadelphia Orchestra are still available. I could get, uh, once in a while I get a royalty. Uh, our last royalty was $24, wasn't it? <laughs> well, hey, it's $24. <laughs> I'm so proud that they want to buy the, still buy the recording or still putting it out, that's fine. Well, however, but uh, he said to me, if you can get Heifetz to record, because he only records for RCA, I'll give you the moon. I said, well, uh, I, can I get to see him? He said, nobody gets to see Heifetz. Maybe you can. I said, I'll try. And I thought, the best way to do that I called Gregor Piatigorsky, the famous cellist who played quartets and trios with Heifetz. And I had met him as a young boy. It's in the book how I had met him. And he remembered me. Oh, how could you forget me? <laughs> and uh, I said, can I come see you? And I told him that I was conductor of the Chamber Symphony of Philadelphia. We were going to record. And he said, Sure, come see me. Come talk to me. And so I flew to California, and it was a marvelous reunion. I loved seeing him again. He was six foot two or three, tall and vivacious, and just absolutely a charming man, and a great cellist. And I spent the whole day and the evening with him. I never got around to asking him how to approach Heifetz, which is the reason I was there. <laughs> Finally, I said, you know, I, I would love to. I have to leave and go back to Philadelphia, but do you think you could give me an address so that I could write to Yasha Heifetz? He said, sure, sure, i give you an address. And he gave me the address, and I went home, and I put together a letter to Heifetz, and in it, I had already been told that Heifetz always was interested in a good question. Give him a good question, he'll answer you. And so I wrote him and I said, Mr. Heifetz, we have a new chamber symphony in recording for RCA and you've recorded just about everything except one work. And I would like to record that with you. And I never told him what it was. And I honestly forgot about it. I was in the tailor shop. Um, I was being fitted for a new suit. That's another story. But uh, knock on the door, and someone, a girl, came in and said, "Mr. Griswold, there's a gentleman on the phone that wants to talk with you. He says his name is Heifetz." <laughs> I said, "Really?" I got on. I put. I pulled my trousers on. Excuse me. And I went out and I grabbed the phone. I said, hello. He said, Mr. Brusselow. He spoke very softly. I said, yes. He says, this is Yasha Heifetz. You sent me a letter and you said I, was re I recorded everything except one work. What is it? 
I said, well, I think you ought to think about recording with me and the Chamber Symphony. He says, yes, yeah, but. And I'm trying to prolong it, make it exciting. I said, well, you know, it really is. He said, what is it? I said, the Four Seasons of Vivaldi. Dead silence, he said. When I decide to record it, I'll call you. <laughs> I talked to Heifetz. <laughs> I met him earlier in Cleveland. He came to play in Cleveland. What a great, great violinist he was. Well, so be that as it may, thank you for being here. You are most kind. And I love being with you. It brings back <laughs> wonderful memories. Our rehearsals in this hall right here and in the Murkison. And the other building. The other building was special. That, that small hall was what I really loved to play in. It was comfortable. But this is a marvelous hall, too. And I didn't think I'd live to see it. But I did. I mean, <laughs> I've lived to see a lot of things now. And I think one of those is something that I didn't dream of. Was my wife and I have a new great-granddaughter, first one, and she is adorable. Looks just like me when I was a baby. <laughs> Don't you think so? <laughs> anyway, questions, come on, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, what do you oh, want to say? Yeah. I was going to ask, uh, well, you started the pop series for the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. I was wondering if you could talk about your relationship with popular music. Relationship of with popular pop. music. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me put it this way. The popular music that I was presenting was up, up to the date music at the time. Uh, there was, uh, what was coming out now and then was the Beatles, Chicago, um, uh, th those tunes, those people, those artists, Mel Torme, uh, and I had a, a, someone who uh, did orchestrations, Bill Holcomb, and he, I just, he just came into me one day when I was teaching at uh, Temple University and showed me some arrangements that he had done. And so uh, I had him do arrangements of Beatle tunes, Chicago, for symphony orchestra. I wanted to involve the symphony. And they were very, very, very well received, except some of the players in the orchestra resented the fact that they had to play that kind of music. That was, that's wrong. Uh, that, that, that was wrong from the beginning. Not on my part, but to lower their standards, as they put it, to play that stuff is not, not, a, not what they wanted. And so, with the board of directors uh, unhappy with me, that's one of the only places that I, I was fired from a position. I, I don't hide it. Uh, in fact, I, I always tell it as it was. Uh, that was part of the reason that the players didn't want to play this music. And then the board thought I was trying to push it too hard, too far. I wasn't planning to have a Pops orchestra. I just thought we'd make money. And we did. We did. We made lots of money. We, we gave the first performance here of Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah, I, I remember sitting in, in my office at the Dallas Symphony and my secretary came in and said, uh, there's someone on the phone. And this was the hyphens. Someone on the phone uh, who would want to know if you could get, give her two tickets to the Jesus Christ Superstar. And I said, who? Oh, she says, her name is Greer Garson. I said, you're joking. She said, no. 
And so I got on the phone. It was Jared Robertson. Yeah, she wanted to. I want two tickets to Jesus Christ Superstar. And it. Uh, I can't remember the boy's name who brought the parts. They actually the parts for the orchestra were still in ink, still being written when we brought it here. He played it at the convention center. We had almost 10,000 people there. It was a tremendous success, but oh, it's not what the orchestra was supposed to do. I know, I know that, but sometimes you have to do other things to make things where other things work. And I felt that was important. I still do to this day. And I wouldn't snub my nose at any music. Except I, I can't t take hard rock, and uh, that, that's out of my realm. And uh, I, I really don't want it. But if, if, it, if rock and roll is important, then, then you would like some Wagner. Because Wagner's rhythms are rock and roll. Honestly, they are. If you look, listen carefully to the Overture to Rienzi, that, that's a rock and roll rhythm. It's a beat. And nobody had gone, what? Are you kidding? No, I'm serious. Okay, so anything else we need? Yes, sir. Difficult to ask without music, but I'm going to improvise. Okay. Um, I'm curious, did you, it's kind of like picking between your most favorite child, did you have a favorite piece to play as a violinist? as an orchestral musician, and a favorite piece to conduct? Uh, I've, I've been asked that question. And let me tell you, one of my favorites are what I've been playing, what I'm playing at the moment. That's my favorite. If it's the Sibelius Violin Concerto, yeah, that's my favorite. If it's Tchaikovsky, that's my favorite. Brahms. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I love them all. But I really, really love classical music. And it's been a way of life for me. And I wouldn't change anything in my lifestyle, in my wife, the way it's, it's, it's happened to me. Uh, it's been very, very difficult in many ways. But in certain ways, uh, could, excuse me, could I sit down? Would you mind? <laughs> oh, thank you. When you get to a certain age, your legs go. Uh, um, where was I there? You said your favorite is what you're doing at the Oh, time. the favorite is what I'm doing at the time. Uh, I remember very much enjoying uh, being able to stand up and play a violin concerto at the drop of a hat. And I, sometimes I had to do that. When uh, uh, I was my first week in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and I was, uh, that's in the book. Yes, it is. Well, you'll read it in the book. It's more, it's better in the book. But I loved it. And, when that happens, and somebody asks you to, like, like Orman, they asked me to play the Brahms, you know, right there. Instant, so-called. And I did. I would never do it again. I, I, I wake up during the night sometimes thinking, how did I do that? How could I play that kind of concerto? That's impossible. I know I did, which only proves a point. It doesn't pay to practice. <laughs> I can say it now. Don't practice. It'll come to you. But oh, I, I tell you, it was. Uh, I think that I, I don't have a favorite. Uh, let's put it that way. I loved uh, the Sibelius Violin Concerto. I always felt it was written for me. But. Uh, Heard your uh, I, I, well, and I, I played it in a, in a way that, uh, well, I, I just loved it. And I wanted that opportunity, which never came, to play it for Sibelius himself. That would have been a great treat for me.
but you win some, you lose some. And that never happened. Should have, but it didn't. Um, anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, conducting an orchestra or composing music has its own set of challenges. But I would imagine that collaborating with an author on telling your life story would also have challenges. Could you talk a little bit about that collaboration, one or both of you? <laughs> you want to answer that? Hold the mic close. Come closer to me. It was actually really easy to, is this on? It was very easy to collaborate with Ancho. Um, he has a great memory, and also I had Marilyn's memory, so the two of them would often discuss things and, and figure out between them what had really happened. And I could do a lot of research to find other material and background material, and then bring that to Anshel, and that would spark more of his memories. Um, I would say one of the hardest things about um, collaborating with Anshel is that he's a musical genius and his relationship to music is nonverbal, and he doesn't really see the point of putting things into language because why would you? You just you just listen to it. It's just it's music and um, so there were times when I wanted to write about things. I wanted to have his voice express how he felt about particular pieces of music and it was difficult to get him to tell me I mean, I would get a little bit from him and then keep feeding him back things and he would respond to them. And, um, and I worked with other musicians. And, uh, but it was, that was probably the hardest thing was actually writing about music because he doesn't need to. <laughs> but people want to read about it. Well, let me, let me just say, what I thought was very difficult for me and I didn't realize it until we started doing this, is the fact that, think about trying to remember what happened 50, 60, 70 years ago. I don't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> so it really, and Robin was so uh, patient with me, trying to, to ask the question again, and speaking in terms of, well, you remember you said this or you said that, which helped me greatly, greatly. But uh, I, I found that very hard. And I, I didn't want to misrepresent anyone as far as the book is concerned. I wanted to be as exact as I could with what someone said, what they did, how they said it. Uh, and when, when I, for instance, uh, if I laughed at what Ormandy said or what he did, I really did, and it was just the way he put it. Uh, really, you'd have to visualize his sitting in the automobile with me, and he wore his he wore a, 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 a blue a blue overcoat coat, yeah, a brown hat. Coat and a brown hat, and he was so short that all you could see from the outside was the hat. <laughs> and he sat in the front with me, and uh, uh, I would be laughing because he, turn, he first thing he'd do when he'd get out of my car was to turn on the radio. And where's the where's the classical music station? Uh, I, I don't listen to classical music, but I I, I try. And then uh, we, we were trying to find a concert hall. And he said, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I said, don't you ever f get a map and find where it is? I said, no, I, I really, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, he, and then I, I'd stop and get gasoline. He said, ask him where it is. And then when I get back in the car, he said, don't you ever get gasoline before you pick me up? I said, well, I hope that one day you pay for the gas. <laughs> He said, oh, what do you mean? You've got per diem, don't you? I said, yeah, but that's not enough. Especially if we get lost. We're going <laughs> to... Yeah. I really, I would have fun with him. But, 
Uh, so there, there, does that answer your question? Yes. Good. Anybody else? Thank you for being here. You are just wonderful. I appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy the book. It really is a fun, a fun book. Really. Thank you. <laughs>